You are listening to episode number 50 of the Everything Ham Radio podcast. My name is Curtis. My call sign is Kilo5 Charlie Lima Mike. Today we're going to be talking about the cold season cousin of the ARRL field day, and that is winter field day, and some of the challenges that come along with it. In our Amateur Radio Club Spotlight, we talk about the Chesapeake Amateur Radio Service, and we talk about some upcoming events, some contests, quite a few ham fests over the next two weeks, and wrap it up with some news from around the hobby. We also have some exciting news that I'm probably sure that you've seen on our Facebook page, as well as on the website, but we're going to announce it right away here shortly, so stay tuned. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Everything Ham Radio Podcast. My name is Curtis, my call sign is Kilo5 Charlie Lima Mike, and I am your host for this podcast. This podcast is released every Thursday morning. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash everything ham radio. We also have a uh, Facebook group that you can find at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash everything ham radio. I'm on Twitter at K5CLM. I'm on uh, Instagram. I'm on uh, several other things. Uh, you can find links to all those on the uh, website under social on the, on the main title bar. Today we're going to be talking about the cold season cousin of the ARRL field day, which is winter field day. And so we're going to talk about some of the challenges that come along with having a event in the cold weather. And there's quite a few of them, actually. But we're going to be talking kind of about what goes on with it, what some of the rules and stuff are, how it works, and then some of the challenges a little bit later. But before we get started for today, I have a couple things that I want to talk to you all about. I want to welcome, first off, a brand new sponsor, my first ever sponsor for this podcast, and that is the West Mountain Radio. Now, if you've never heard of them, they are the makers of the Rig Blaster, of uh, the um, Rig Runner. They have a DC and Go pack, which is a very awesome uh, system, and they have several other things. And one of the things that they are... Uh, helping me with as part of the sponsorship is they're giving away a free gift with any purchase. Now, basically what this thing is, is a uh, USB port monitor is what it is. And it's really neat. It's really cool. It's, it, it basically, it measures the voltage and the current that's coming out of the USB spot. Um, it tests USB based chargers for current and flow and proper turnoff. Um, you get one gift may re be redeemed per person at the time of purchase. And the, only, the way that you have to, to get it, you go to their website, westmountainradio.com, and you pick whatever you want. Now, the one thing that I would rec really, really, really recommend is getting the DC to go pack. Now, these things are really awesome. We're going to be talking about it a little bit further uh, later on in the program. But when you enter the coupon code of EHP17 at checkout, you get this free gift. So definitely head on over there and check that out. And I want to thank uh, and welcome West Mountain Radio as a sponsor for this program. A couple of other things I want to do. Uh, I got a couple of donations this past uh, couple weeks. And it, it just blows my mind that here we are in 2017. I took last week off, like I had mentioned before, for, for Christmas and stuff like that. And to spend time with the family. But a lot happened in those two weeks. And, and it, it really just blows my mind, right? And and I'll, I'll tell you here a little bit more about it here in just a second. But first off, I want to thank Brian Stanford for becoming a, patri a Patreon on Patreon. He has graciously offered to a $1 per episode donation. So thank you very much, Brian. And I hope that that $1 donation that you're making per episode is going to uh, be warranted. And if you would like to make become a Patreon uh, and make a $1 pledge per episode, $5 pledge, whatever, uh, you can simply do that. Just go to... Uh, uh, Go to everythinghamradio.com forward slash support, and there's instructions on how to do that. I also want to thank Andrew Cornwall for your $10 donation through PayPal. Thank you very much for that, and I actually put that $10 to good use already. So um, basically, before I go on any further, I want to talk to you a little bit about what's been going on. Well, 
If you remember back a few episodes, I told you all about a new microphone that I got um, as a Christmas gift from the guys over at Ham Radio 360. Now, that was just the start of everything that's happened since then. I mean, this this last three weeks or so have just been awesome for me and, and this podcast and hopefully the growth, the continued growth of it. Um, first off, I got the the uh, the microphone, and I've been doing now like I think this is like the third or fourth episode, and this is episode number fifty. If you didn't realize, big accomplishment. We got some stuff we want to talk about here a little later, but uh, that was the start of it. Um, shortly there afterwards, I made contact, or I had made contact with West Mountain Radio before that, and they agreed to become a sponsor. Well, the the money that I got from being a sponsor helped me upgrade my recording quote studio. I'm not doing it at work anymore like I have been in the past. And you know, when I did it at work, it was like taking me six hours or so to record a one hour podcast and cause it was like, okay, I, I talk for five minutes or so. And then somebody would, the, the phone would ring or somebody would say something on the radio. So I'd have to stop it, answer the phone, come back to it, you know, delete part of the thing where the, where the phone is ringing or where the radio was going off or something like that. And then figure out what I was doing. And I would totally lose my train of thought. Well, now I actually have a recording studio ish thing. What I've done, I've taken this mic and I've ran with it with the part of the sponsorship money that I got, I have me a um, microphone boom arm. I have me a pop filter. So hopefully you're not going to be hearing the, the T's and the P's and stuff like that so much. And also have me a small uh, Behringer mixer, just a little two channel thing. Uh, but it works really great. And I hope that y'all really love it. Um, I've set my little, I have a little desk in a, uh, uh, in a old tack room uh, for our um, what's now my workshop. It, it was originally a horse stall, uh, small barn type thing, and I've changed it into my workshop. Well, the outside part of it I closed all in. Uh, that's where I do all my woodworking and stuff. And the ta- the old tack room is now my office, and it's part of my recording studio. So here I am sitting. I have my computer. I have my mixer. I have my mic and stuff all set up. I have an extra monitor that I can look at. So it's it's really not looking nice. And once I get it all cleaned up and stuff, I'll take a picture of it and post it on, on my website. So stay tuned for that. But that's just where it's gone. And, you know, everything is just kind of snowballing uh, this past month. I, you know, I've been struggling for so long. And I want to thank each and every one of y'all for your continued support and your continued listening, uh, even though some of the episodes might not have been all that great. So thank you very much for sticking with me. And to that effect, I want to say thank you to everybody that is listening. This this year has been awesome for me. Um, if you remember, I started about this time last year. I believe it was on like the 10th or the 12th, something like that. I didn't go back and look. I meant to go back and look. But it was about the 10th or 12th, something like that, that I started this podcast. And it was... <clears throat> excuse me. Since then, it has just really exploded. And it went from having you know, 100, 200 listeners uh, downloads per episode to now the past um, four, six episodes, eight episodes, something like that, having well over a thousand per episode. And this last month in December has been my best episode or my best month yet. I beat my last record month by about 150 or so. So not a real big thing, but I, for the month of December, there were 6,286 downloads uh, for all the episodes that are up there. And most of those were the the four or five episodes around December, maybe like the, the last one or two in November, and then all the ones in December. 6,000 plus downloads. So thank you very, very much. And as I look at the year total, my year in total was 47,436 downloads. That is awesome for a first year podcast. And, you know, I, I've slowly crept up. You know, I, I when it, the first couple months it was you know three four hundred three four hundred episode or downloads per episode. Then it jumped up to like six hundred uh, downloads per episode, and then it was up to like eight fifty nine hundred something like that. 
And like I said, the last month and a half, two months or so has been over a thousand for every one of them. And I think my highest one is something around like 1800 downloads. And I believe it's like the, the mobile radio inst- uh, uh, episode that I had, uh, Alan, Alan, uh, Applegate, I believe, or something like, um, that we talked about. So go back and check that out. That was a really awesome, uh, episode. So basically that averages out to 968 downloads per episode. Now, like I said, that is awesome, especially from our first year. So thank you very much for all those that have listened and have stuck with me through my ups and downs, through the, uh, not necessarily poor quality mic, but my marginal quality, uh, headset that I had and the, all the work that I've gone in, it's made it so much easier since I've been able to do it at home. So please, uh, Please continue to share this podcast with your friends. Help me grow even more next year. My goal is to have over 100,000 downloads uh, next year. So please continue to share it with your friends. Um, also, I mentioned one thing a couple episodes ago, and I, I've kind of slacked off on it. I didn't it, I didn't mention it um, on the last episode or the episode before that, I believe. I have a survey, and I would really appreciate if... Each and every one of y'all would take it. Super easy to go to. Just go to everythinghamradio.com forward slash survey. It's about a 10 question uh, survey. Uh, basically talks about the different segments that I have, uh, how you like it, how you rate it, stuff like that. Stuff that you, uh, what's your favorite part of uh, each episode, what's your least favorite part, what can I do better, and and just general um uh, recommendations. So please go to that. Um, so far I've only had about six people take it. I've had some pretty good insights on it though. So thank you for those that have taken the survey already. I have taken it to heart. Um, and we'll, you'll see a little bit about that here a little later when we talk about the events. Um, also being that this is episode number 50, this is a big episode, uh, for any podcast. I mean, number 50 is a, is a, you know, it's a good target. You know, most people don't last through like episode seven, I think seven or 10 or something like that is like the, the, the general number of when a podcast will die out. I've made it to 50. Yay. <laughs> you know, thank y'all each and every one of y'all for, for helping me make it. But I want to especially thank George, uh, Zafiroff, Zafiropoulos. George, I'm sorry, I probably butchered your name. I might have said it right. But anyways, uh, KJ6VU with Pac10.com. He has made a donation, as well as Dan Romachek, KB6NU, has given me a donation for some prizes that we're going to be giving out next episode. But I'm going to tell you all about them this episode, and we'll pick the winner next episode. Um, uh, George over at Pac10 has uh, graciously offered a $100 gift certificate to packtenant.com and that will basically get you pretty much uh, any infed um packtena um that gets you the packtena mini i believe um and several other things so a hundred dollar gift certificate from packtena.com uh dan over at kb6 and you if you don't know him he is the author of the no nonsense study guides and these books are awesome i have the technician uh ebook that you can download on his website for free at kb6nu.com uh, but he also has others he has a general no nonsense guide he has an extra no nonsense guide uh, he has a C- learning cw guide uh, and several other ebooks and hard copy books as well but he has graciously offered uh, that one lucky winner will have the option to download any one or all of his ebooks. So if you're a technician and you're looking to upgrade to extra and learn CW, you can win the chance to go over to kb6nu.com and download the ebooks for the general class study guide, the extra class study guide, the CW study guide, any book that he any ebook that he has, you can download. So thank you very much Dan for that. Um, I also have one other in the works. I have not call, heard back from them. Hopefully, uh, I will hear back from them. Hopefully, will, they will uh, help me out with a donation with that. Um, and I will announce it if I do get it on the next one. And we'll, we'll, we will pick a winner. Um, and the, the last thing, um, I'm going to make a custom call sign desk plate for one lucky winner. Might make it two. We'll see. We'll see come next episode. So please make sure you enter. So how do you enter? How do you enter to win this? Well, it's going to be super simple. You know, being that this is the 50th episode, I wanted to make sure that I included everybody uh, 
that has ever signed up for my email list the chance to win as well. I didn't want to make it where, you know, like I have before, you know, send me an email with a certain subject line or something like that. I didn't want to do that because being that this is the 50th episode and we were celebrating the 50th episode in the last 49, well, 50 previous to this, I wanted to make sure that everybody had an opportunity to win. So if you are already on my email list, you are already entered to win one of these items. Now, if you're not... Super easy. All you got to do is go to everythinghamradio.com forward slash subscribe and you can subscribe to the email list. You can also go to the show notes of this episode or any other episode for that matter. You can find that at everythinghamradio.com forward slash podcast forward slash 50. It'll show all the show notes that are, that are going to be on this thing. There's going to be a lot more information that we're going to be talking about in this podcast. But there is actually two separate forms on the show notes that you can subscribe to the email list. So head on over to the show notes, head on over to the subscribe page and sign up for my email list. Now I don't send emails all the time. You know, basically it's a, you'll get an email when I publish a new blog post, which is few and far between anymore, or when I publish a new uh, podcast episode. So that's all you got to do. So the, uh, I think 106 subscribers or something like that, 126 subscribers, or something like that, that I have right now, you're already entered to win. If you're not sure, go to the show notes, go to the subscribe page and subscribe. If you're already on the list, then you're already on the list and it'll tell you you're already on the list. But if you're not, head on over there, sign up. You can win, again, $100 gift certificate from Pac10.com. Any one or all of Dan Romanchik's KB6NU's uh, study guides on ebook format. And he has them on Kindle, he has them on EPUB, he has them on... Um, uh, several other formats. So, ebook easy, easy, super easy. Um, one other thing I'm not going to mention right now, but I might have, and then one, possibly two, custom made uh, call sign desk plates. So, make sure you head on over there and enter to win that. Okay, I think that's pretty much all the announcements that I have. Um, we're going to take a quick break and talk about our new sponsor. Okay, so like I said, um, I want to welcome West Mountain Radio as a sponsor for this podcast. My very first one. So thank you, West Mountain Radio, for uh, taking the chance on me. And, you know, if you've never used a rig blaster or a rig runner or anything else, these things are awesome. They can do a whole bunch of stuff. I've used a, a rig blaster now for about 15 years, and they are awesome. You can use them as an echo link uh, node. You can use them as an announcement machine for your uh, repeater. You can use them as a, a, a emergency repeater. You can use them on RTTY or PSK21 or several other things. These things are so awesome. And they're really not that bad price. You can get a um, a Rig Blaster, I believe it's called a Rig Blaster Nano, I want to say off the top of my head, for like 49 bucks, Something like that. Maybe 59 bucks. So uh, definitely go over and check them out. But these things, they're really nice. And, and the main things I guess really they have are the Rig Blaster, the Rig Runner, which we've talked about before um, in a couple episodes, and also the DC to go boxes. These DC to go boxes are really neat. Um, but I talked about the Rig Blaster, I believe, last episode um, when I was going through my wish list <laughs> that I would like for Christmas. I would, I would really like another one of those. Um, maybe a little updated one because mine's like the first version they put out 15 years ago. Um, but the Rig Runner we've talked about a couple times. We talked about it a little bit in the mobile installation thing. These things are really nice. You you have one power cord coming into the cab of your vehicle or into your ham shack or whatever. And each each separate things, they have like six or eight or I think up to 12 different uh, slots that you can come out of. Each one of them are fused. Each one of them has the, um, um, oh, what are those things called? The... Um, my mind just totally went blank here. Mm. The Anderson power poles. That's what they're called. <laughs> I hate it when my, you know, I have this, this like brain, um, well, you know what I'm talking about. Anyways, they have each of those, uh, the Anderson power poles built into each slot. Each one of them has like a 10 amp fuse or a 20 amp fuse or whatever. So they're really neat. But I really want to tell you all about the DC to go boxes because these things are really, really neat. 
basically they are a way to put a battery into your station at your repeater site in a contained box. That way, in case anything ever happens to the radio, if it has a leak, or the battery, if it has a leak, it won't mess up your carpet, or won't mess up your linoleum, and eat through the floor, or whatever. It's in a nice sealed container. Well, on top of that, they have a what's called a Super Power Gate PG40, and a Rig Runner uh, 4007U, or a 4008, built, already mounted onto the side of the box. Awesome. Really, they are. Head on over to the show notes to take a look at it, or you can see them on the main page on the sidebar, on the top, on the, the there's a banner in the show notes uh, where you can see what these things are. Now, the the power gate provides you a uninterrupted uninterruptible power supply. In case you lose AC power, it'll automatically switch over to the battery that's in the box. Perfect solution for like a repeater backup for uh, operating winter field day like we're going to be talking about today. Uh, or for your station at your home. If you lose power during a storm, it will automatically change over to the battery in the box. Awesome. The second thing it's mounted on is the rig runner. Now there's two of them that you can choose from. And they're about $20 difference I think. But there's the rig runner 4008 which provides you with 40 amps of DC power over 8 slots. Now, the uh, 4007U also has 40 amps, but it's only across 7 slots. Now, if you notice, the, the 4007U is a little bit more expensive, and here's why. There are some extra features that are built into the 4007U. It has a digital load meter on it, so you can see how much amperage you're pulling from that battery at any time. It also has a USB charging slot, as well as a solid-state push-button on-off switch and an automatic shutoff for high or low voltages. So the 4007U, it's only like an extra 20 bucks. I highly recommend that you get that over the 4008, but either one of them, either one of them are great systems. The 4008 also has the automatic shutoff for low voltages, but I don't think it has it for high. It doesn't have the push-button on-off switch. It doesn't have the load meter. Um, but it does have one extra plug. So if you need eight plugs instead of seven, go with the 4008. But if you only, if you need less than seven or seven or less, t spend the extra 20 bucks and you get the 4007U. Now, both of these are mounted on the side of the battery box. All you have to do, put your battery in there, hook the leads up to it, run it to the, uh, to the power gate, run it to the, to the um, rig runner, and you're ready to go. Both of these are pre-made. All you got to do, click the button, yes, I want to buy it, and it will be shipped to you right away. Now, if you want something something a little bit different than these two things, you can also custom make your own. You know, you can have a uh, super power gate with a with a different um, rig runner, or you can have it without the power gate, or several things. There is links in the show notes of today's episode for the direct link for the one with the four thousand eight uh, rig runner. There's one for the 4007U rig runner, and there's also the custom make your own link in the show. So please head on over there, check out West Mountain Radio, check out the DC power, uh, the DC to go battery box, and buy one. They are awesome, awesome little boxes. So okay, let's get on to what we're talking about today. So the reason I told you all about that beforehand, before we got to the tech corner uh, segment of this podcast, is because a lot of the DC to go box can be used in events like today. We're talking about winter field day. So uh, the winter field day website can be found at winterfieldday.com. Super easy. You can also go to the show notes, everything hamradio.com forward slash podcast forward slash 50. And there's a link to their website. And there's also a link to their Facebook page. Now winter field day basically started in 2006. And there was a suggestion made uh, for SPAR, S-P-A-R, uh, to sponsor a winter field day. And SPAR was a club, I believe, at the time. Um, it was made, uh, and after discussion on the forums, rules and a date was set. And on January 13th and 14th, 2007, the first annual field day was held. And based on the comments from the participants, it went down in the record books as the start of an annual tradition and has gone on ever since. And it's a pretty cool little thing. I I personally haven't haven't uh, participated in it. I just learned about it actually last year. I think I talked about it a little bit 
um, last year uh, at the beginning of the year, I believe. Maybe I heard it over on Ham Radio 360. Now, I know if you haven't already listened to last episode of Ham Radio 360, make sure you do. Um, Kale actually had an interview with one of the uh, committee members or one of the head honchos over at the Winterfield Day Association. Really awesome uh, episode to listen to. So head on over to hamradio360.com and listen to their latest episode. So basically it all started when uh, Charles N5PVL asked us Bar would be interested in sponsoring a Winterfield Day activity. Uh, discussion followed, rules were proposed and modified, and all culminating in a vote in September approving SPAR sponsorship. Next came a flurry of activity to get the word out on fairly short notice, and finally the actual actual contest in January. Walt W5ALT, Charlie KY5U contributed greatly to the success of SPAR and Winter Field Day. However, due to medical issues, acti- uh, issues active activity within SPAR, their forum, forum and support of Winter Field Day have declined. Walt did state in the forum that there was somewhat that he was somewhat overloaded. Many amateur operators were upset in 2015. Scores were not posted, and we could not get a response from Spar. They also thought the Winter Field Day would just fade away. That was when several of several people banded together and formed the Winter Field Day Association. Good job, guys. <laughs> the rules are the same, and the date is still the same. The last full weekend in January, a temporary committee has been set up to get things up and running. Uh, that's Tom WD8MBE, Bill VE3CLQ, Eric uh, WX4ET, Dave W3DET, and Ken N8KC. Um, so basically, that's what it is. That's what it's coming from. It came from 2007. It went strong. It kind of faded away. People got over overworked, overloaded, and it started to fade away a little bit. People got upset. Well, now. There's a Winterfield Day Association, and they are running strong and trying their hardest to make this the best Winterfield Day ever so far. So, let's talk a little bit about the rules. And we're going to talk go a little bit other ways. But let's get the rules out of the way. So, as far as entry categories, you know, on regular field day, you have your emergency power, you have your um, uh, emergency operations center, you have your... Uh, home station, you have, you know, several different classifications, you know, A, B, C, D, E, and F, I believe. Well, in winter field day, there's three. There's indoor, uh, which is when you operate from inside a remote, insulated, heating, or cooled, probably not very much cooled, maybe here in Texas, because it's not always that cool, uh, but anyways, building, and it's weather protective structure, where an amateur radio station is normally not available. And that's, I'm talking about like a park, uh, a building, a a cabin, maybe your EOC center, community center, uh, senior uh, senior center, etc. The next thing is outdoor. Now, the people that can do this in winter, in the north, kudos to each and every one of y'all. Now, I have some videos on the show notes, so make sure you check out the show notes this episode because there's a lot of really neat videos on people that have previously participated in Winter Field Day. And it, 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 it blows my mind that you actually sit out in the cold, in the snow, in freezing temperatures in like a tent or something like that and work Winter Field Day. But kudos to you because basically, you know, really with even with the ARRL Field Day in June... It, it's basically for setting up a station in suboptimal conditions, right? That's the whole reason behind field day. Well, this is the exact same thing. That's the reasoning behind it as well. But the thing is, is that in June, you know, it's typically fair weather pretty much anywhere in the U.S. or pretty much anywhere in the world, I think. Typically fair weather. And it's warmer. And you don't have the issues that you have with winter. You don't have the cold temperatures. You don't have to worry about different things. I'm not really going to get into it. I don't want to get into it just yet because I'm going to talk about it a little later. But anyways, outdoor. Uh, you out, The outdoor category is uh, operation from a location partly or fully exposed to the elements and at least 30 feet away from your normal station location and not using any part of previously erected antenna system or ham station. 
uh, stuff like a campground, a park pavilion, a canopy, a picnic table, a tent, a pop-up camper, a uh, backyard shed, uh, sitting under your deck, or something like that. Operation from a non-insulated c- uh, car, truck, van, boat, uh, mobile or not, is considered outdoors. So if you're sitting on your back deck and you're 30 feet away from your typical radio, uh, radio shack, you're considered outdoors. Now, there's some people that take this to the to the extreme and will set up on like a mountainside or something like that in a tent with, you know, three feet of snow on the ground and stuff like that. And more power to you, but I'm sorry, it's just not for me. I'm not into that cold stuff. I mean, it's cold enough here in, in my little recording studio because it's not fully insulated and, I, and my heater doesn't sound like it's working. Um, but it's like 50 degrees out, 45 degrees outside. So it's cool enough for me as it is. I, I just can't see spending, you know, uh, sitting in a tent um, in 20 degree weather. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sorry, I just can't do that. You know, there's times I'm sure that I probably might eventually have to do that, you know, if something happens because this is for... What would happen if if a major event happened right now? You know, you know, last two weeks ago or three weeks ago or whatever it was when I talked about my pipes bursting because it got, it froze. Well, guess what? It's gonna freeze here again on Thursday, and it's gonna be down to like twenty five degrees. I'm hoping that my pipes don't freeze again. I'm gonna be working my tail end off tomorrow to try and get some stuff put up under my house, my underpinning, at least partial of my underpinning put up and my pipes insulated and make sure that my water's running so that my pipes, please no, don't freeze again next, next, you know, this weekend. That stuff really, really, really was bad. Um, but anyways, getting off subject here, the last inter- entry category is home. Now home is operation from inside a home or inside another structure attached to a home that could and would be the usual location of your amateur station. Now, if you have, you know, wherever your your regular ham shack is set up at, that's what your home thing is. Generally, using a previously erected antenna system, so your antenna that's up on top of your tower, if it's already there, it's already there. Um, A home entrant may still be eligible to claim alternate power bonus if you're not using commercial power. So if you're sitting here in your ham shack and you have a generator running outside outside the window or something like that and you have all your stuff powered on that, you can get the alternate power bonus. We're going to talk about bonuses here in just a second. But if you use your commercial power, your, your ham shack just as it sits right now, you're not going to get that. But you can't if you have a generator or if you have batteries or if you have a solar panel or something like that. Um, use of any pre-existing or permanently installed antenna system or station components renders your station as a home station. So if you are sitting out on your back deck or you're sitting out in your yard and you're using your antenna system that is part of your regular ham shack that you use every other day of the, of the, of the year, you got to consider it as a home. You can't consider it as an outdoor. Now, if you put a little push-up pole out in the middle of your yard or attach it to the end of your deck or or run a, a, a pack 10 of mini or something like that up a tree or something, that's going to be separate. Then you're going to be considered outdoors. So however you're going to do it, make sure you know the rules on indoor, outdoor, or home. Okay, so let's talk about uh, a little bit the entry class. Your entry class is a number designated by the number of stations in your entry that are capable of simultaneous communications. Now, this basically is is just like what regular field day is in June. However many uh, stations that you have that are simultaneously transmitting. You know, if you have four stations set up and you have two operators, you're only going to be two because you're not going to be running all four at the same time. One of them is going to have to shut down in order for another one to go up. So... Figure out how you're going to do this, and and now is the time to do it. You're about three weeks away from Winter Field Day, I believe, when this thing goes live. So if you haven't already started preparing, you're behind the eight ball already. So make sure you get that in. <laughs> figure it out. Figure out what you're going to do. Even if you run just a home class, running from your regular ham station, get on the air for a couple hours. Help this thing grow because this thing... This winter field day is something that can really happen, and it's something that's fun. It's something that's really fun to do. I mean, it's not as big as the AWRL field day in June, but it very well could be. And it's real life. You never know when a, when a 
um, major event is going to happen where, you know, a tornado or whatever. It, well, probably not a tornado when it's cold, but, you know, a blizzard. Knocking out power for everybody. Knocking out communications. You're going to have to know when and how to set up stations when it's cold, when it's hot, when it's raining, when it's snowing, when it's windy, whatever. All these things you're going to have to figure out. So this is a perfect example of how to do something when it's cold. Why not prepare now, figure out now what you're going to do in case of something major happens later on when it's cold. There you go. Okay, I'm off my soapbox now. <laughs> Okay, so what about the exchange? You know, typically with the regular AWR field day, you do, you know, if you're running two stations, you're running off emergency power, you're going to be 2A. Here where I live, it's going to be 2A North Texas. The um, locations are the same as what the AWRL field day in June is. Same thing. They're using the same sections. Depending on how many radios you have is what your number is going to be, just like with the AWR field day. The only thing different, instead of the Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo, Foxtrot, you're going to be using um, Hotel for Home, India for Inside, and Oscar for Outside. So it could be 2, two Hotel North Texas, or 6 Oscar South Carolina, or 9 India California, or Orange County, or whatever. Basically, in short, it's the exchange that you're going to be giving, you're going to be giving your call sign, your class and your category, and your AWRL section. Super easy. Just like the AWRL field day, just different letters. Just different category letters. That's it. Okay, so what about points? Points, you get one point per, per phone QSO. You get two points per CW and digital QSO, just like on the AWRL field day thing. Uh, best of the exchanges will be penalized by one additional point for missed exchanges or call sign. So if you only get half of it, you know, like if you get the person you're talking to, but your person you're talking to doesn't get it, you get penalized a point. I guess is from what I'm understanding. I might be wrong. Um, duplicate contacts with the same call band and mode will not be counted, uh, but will not be penalized either. So, it, um, I, and I actually didn't know. I, I don't know if the AWRL field day uh, penalizes you for uh, duplicate contacts or not. I, I don't think I ever remember reading that. Maybe it, maybe it does. I don't know. Um, so, anyways, let's see. Um, modes and band multipliers. Okay, you count one multiplier for each mode operated per band. For example, operating CW and phone on eighty, forty, fifteen, and ten, and CW and PSK on twenty. Uh, FM on 2 meters and 440 will be a total multiplier of 12. Okay, so you got you got that. Okay, so you got um, two points or two multipliers for CW and phone. You're going to be working on 80, 40, 15, and 10. That's four. So eight times uh, four times two is eight. So there's eight. You work CW and PSK on 20. That's two. So now you're up to 10. And you work FM on 2 meters and 440. So your total multiplier is 12. Everybody follow me on that? That's pretty cool, actually. That a good way to boost points. You know, do multiple modes on different on the same bands. So there you go. Uh, power multipliers. If you're running more than a hundred watts, you have a one multiple times one multiplier. If you're running a hundred watts or less, down to QRP levels, which is five watts. So from six watts to hundred watts, you get two x. If you're running QRP you get 4x. So if you're running a Elecraft, uh, what are those things called? The P, uh, PC2 or PX2 or something like that, that was so big at, at Hamvention this this past uh, one. Um, I don't remember what it's called. But anyways, if you're running that and you're running it on, on a 5 watts, you get a 4x multiplier. How awesome is that? And, and I've heard great stories about contacts from those Especially, you know, if you work from like a soda area or something like that, some high peak or something, you can talk forever. Okay, so uh, bonus points. You can claim up to 1,500 bonus points if non-commercial power is used in powering your winter field day station. Only your logging only computer may use any available power. So your radios have to run on emergency power. But you're logging only computer. The only thing you're doing with it is logging. I'm not talking about digital stuff. 
you know, PSK31 or RTT wires or something like that. Those have to be run on emergency power. But locking only computers can use any available power. That means it can use your house power. That could use your, you know, if you're set up at a EOC or whatever. Those can use any available power. But everything else has to be run off a emergency power to claim the 1500, 1500 bonus points. Um, you can claim 1500 uh, bonus points if your operation is outdoors. And we talked about that here just a second ago, what outdoors was. Uh, you can claim 1500 bonus points if your operation is not a home station. Um, you can claim 1500 points for making a QSO via satellite. You can only do this once, but if you make one contact via satellite, you get 1500 bonus points. And later on in the news, I'm going to tell you about a new satellite that's up. So stay tuned for that. Maybe you can make a contact on that. Because it's only going to be up for about a month and a half or something like that from what I understand. We're going to talk about that a little later. But anyways, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Okay, so log submissions. Log submissions must be made to www.wfda at winterfieldday.com uh, via email before 0 UTC time on March 1st to be considered. You have to have WFD 2007 log and then your call sign in the subject line. The other thing is that all logs must be in Cabrillo format and should contain the following information. It should contain the frequency, uh, modes in the log, date, time, uh, QSO data is required, um, the um, call sign that you talk to, the class, and the category and the section and bonus points. Those are the things they have to do. You can go to the show notes. There's a link on there to the field day rules that'll show you how to do that. Now, if you are going to be doing this on paper, if for, for whatever your reason you can't do it on the computer or you just don't want to do it on the computer, you want to do it on paper, there is an example on the winter field day rules page that shows you how it needs to be formatted. If you're going to do it on a computer, there are several programs that have a winter field day logging program already one of them especially one that i would highly recommend i've used this guy's programs for quite a while i use it on field day every year Um, i use it for general context stuff like that that is the n3fjp log program awesome thing he has logs for just about any contest you can get as well as just a general contact log stuff like that really awesome thing you can buy the winter field day only um, program for like nine bucks you can buy his total complete package for everything uh, for, I believe, it's either $49 or $64. I don't remember off the top of my head. My internet is down right now, so I can't look and verify. Um, but I highly recommend that one for sure. So real quick, I wanted to jump in here. I've actually already recorded the podcast. I'm kind of cutting this in, but I finally got news. I talked a little bit earlier about a, another uh, special gift that I was waiting on confirmation on. Well, I got it after I recorded this episode, but I just got done talking about uh, N3FJP's um, software package. That was the one that I was waiting on, and I finally got word back from them. So thank you very much to Scott and Kimberly Davis from N3FJP.com. They have graciously donated a complete N3FJP software package without CD. So that will be the final, the fourth uh, gift giveaway that I'm going to be doing. So if you want this package to use for Winter Field Day, please make sure that you enter. I will be announcing it next week. And I will make sure that you get that gift certificate that they're given before Winter Field Day so you can download it, so you can play with it a little bit and get using it for Winter Field Day. But again, it has so much more other than just Winter Field Day, regular Field Day, QSO parties, uh, just a regular uh, contact log. So much is in this package, so I highly recommend that you get it. Even if you don't win this giveaway for this software package, I highly recommend you buy it. But anyways... Back to what we were saying before. Sorry for the interruption. Um, Also, uh, W3KM has a logging program also that has a dedicated winter field day logging program. Um, Those two are the main ones that are recommended by Winter Field Day Association. The N3FJP is recommended by me. Um, There's also one more, the N1MM log program. 
Uh, I didn't get a chance to look at it before I started recording this. I ran out of time yesterday at work. I got a little busy, but anyways, um, that is also one of the programs that are listed on the Winter Field Day Association website. Okay, right, so now that we have all the official stuff out of the way, let's talk about some challenges that you will pro- possibly come into um, operating in Winter Field Day over the ARRL Field Day. First off is the weather. So the weather is probably the most prominent thing that pops into my head when we talk about winter stuff. And especially for those of y'all, of y'all that are in the north. Now, during the ARRL field day, those of us in the south, especially, have to deal with blistering heat, right? I mean, here in Texas, it's typically in the upper 90s, maybe lower 100s during field day in June. With winter field day, it's probably not as bad here in the south, because it's typically around, like, I think the average high for the end of the... the um, middle of January is about 55 something like that 50 55 for the highs a little lower for the lows typically like upper 30s or something so it's not as bad but these of y'all that live up north that have the snows that have the blizzards that have the freezing temperatures I mean you know a couple weeks ago when it froze down here when we were at like 17 for the low people in like North Dakota and Wyoming and stuff like that they were at like minus 10 minus 15 it's like Dang, that's cold. <clears throat> yeah, not me. Mm-mm. I like the warmth. I like the the warmer. I don't like the the warmth that we have here in June because that's just a little bit too much. It, you know, about seventy or so. That's when it's really awesome for me. Um, okay, so anyways, typically when you have the freezing weather and the colder weather, that's when you have the things that will affect you the most. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what the cold could affect. Okay. The first thing I think about when I'm talking about the cold is how I'm going to stay warm because I like to stay warm. If I'm operating a outside class, I'm going to need some way to get out of the elements, right? I'm going to need something like a pavilion to, to get out of the snow if it's snowing or maybe a wind block on one side or two sides, something like that. Or maybe I operate in a tent or you know, something like that. Something that's going to block the wind because, you know, first off, I don't want to have the wind going across my microphone, right? Uh, and also to keep me warm a little bit. So that's the first thing that pops into my head. The second thing that pops into my head is I'm probably going to have to wear extra layer clothing, right? I'm going to have to have, you know, maybe a undershirt and a long sleeve shirt and a jacket and probably some gloves or something like that. Well, if I wear gloves, how is that going to affect operate you know wearing gloves or wearing mittens is that going to affect me turning the dial on my hf rig trying to find somebody to talk to is that going to affect the way that i write if i'm writing on a paper log or when i'm typing the keys is it going to slow me down probably so and i'll probably make a whole lot of mistakes you know if i'm typing with gloves on because they're a whole lot fatter than my fat fingers are now right so that's one way it's going to do it. You know, it's going to be harder for me to tune the radio. It's going to be harder for me to type or write or whatever it is. So staying warm is probably the most the most thing that I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about winter field day. Okay. The next question you have to ask yourself is how is the cold going to affect your equipment? Now, your radios and your computers probably not going to be that much of an issue because, you know, a computer or a radio generate their own heat. And they can typically be operated pretty cold, right? You know, my computer runs better when it's cold than when it's hot anyways. You know, know, when your computer's running, it's running at like 120 degrees or so typically, or or sometimes higher. Mine runs higher, which really kind of stinks. But, you know, the colder it is outside, the easier it's going to be for your computer or your radio to keep itself cool. So, that I'm not too worried about. That won't really hurt that much. But... What about your coax? What about your antennas? Those things have no real internal heat source to keep themselves warm, right? And if we're talking about antennas, let's talk about that for just a minute. If you have an antenna up and you're operating like a beam or something like that, if it's any kind of precipitation that's out there and you know the, the, the water molecules are attaching to your beam or your vertical and freezing... How is that going to affect your SWRs? 
how is that going to affect the weight of the antenna? You know, if you if you're operating a beam and your elements are twice as um, thick from the ice that's that's freezing on it, how is that going to affect the performance of the beam? Is it going to increase the SWRs? Is it going to make it too heavy for whatever pole you have it on? Is it going to make it too heavy for your uh, rotor to rotate it? You know, all these things come into effect. Now, on top of that, what about your coax? Now, if any of y'all have ever used coax when it's cold, you know it's really, really hard. Now, and I'm not talking about, you know, the little RG58 things. Yes, they're a little harder to deal with when they're cold. But if you're running HF, you're not going to be using RG58. You're going to be using, you know, RG8, LMR400, you know, stuff like that. That's thicker. That's harder. You know, it's hard enough to, to bend those those coaxes when it's hot. But think about when it's cold. You know, when it's cold, they're like a stiff, frozen um, something, right? So it's going to be hard. You're going to have to figure out how to uncoil it if it's cooled up or coiled up already. More than likely, you're going to have the, the coax that you're going to use like in your car or outside in the elements for a couple days beforehand. So it's going to be cold already, right? So you have to figure out how to unravel it. You have to figure out you know, how to get it up the tower that you're putting it on or the push and pull that you're putting on or, or getting it into your tent or whatever. All these things are going to be affected by the cold. And... I, I, I don't know. That, that, that's one of the reasons that I want to stay in the warmth. I don't like the cold. Well, I kind of like the cold. But not really. I don't like the really, really cold. Okay, stop. Stop, Curtis. You're getting offside. I'll subject a little bit here. Whew. Okay, so the other thing that really comes into my mind when it comes to weather is your ground rod. Now, if you're setting, if you're not operating from a home station where your ground rod's already in the ground or from an EOC or something like that where there's already a ground rod, the first thing, you know, if especially if you're in the north and the ground is frozen, you know how hard it's going to be to drive that ground rod into the ground? You know, it's hard enough here in Texas when we don't have a whole lot of rain, like we had a couple, you know, like three or four years ago, I think, something like that. We were in like a major drought, and the ground was like rock hard. You know, that was hard enough. But thinking about it when it's frozen, and especially if it's frozen, you know, like a foot underground or something like that, that's going to take a lot of oomph. To get that ground rod into the ground to get proper grounding. And then come, you have to think about it. If the ground is frozen, you're not going to get a good ground because the ground is frozen, right? So you have to get below that frost line with your ground rod to get proper grounding. So there you go. You know, warmth. How am I going to keep warm? Um, what? How is my keeping myself warm gonna affect my operations gonna be hard for me to tune my radio is it harder for me to type harder for me to write and lastly how does it affect your equipment and especially your coax <laughs> that, that's the things that's just like whew, i don't i don't even want to think about i'll just work as a home station i really wish i could work as a home station i actually have my hf radio sitting here right beside me and no and no tower to put it up on. So I'm not going to be participating in Winter Field Day this year. Maybe next year. I would really like to. I, I really want to get on HF, y'all. I, I would really love to get on HF again. It's been it's been quite a while. But anyways, that is Winter Field Day. So make sure you go over to their website and check it out. Uh, winterfieldday.com uh, Also head on over to the show notes of today's episode. You can get a link to it there as well as a link to the rules. Uh, their Facebook page, and so much more that we've talked about uh, this episode so far and what we're going to be talking about here in just a second. We're running a little bit longer than I thought it was going to be. I didn't think we were going to be at the 52-minute mark by the time I got done with my, my tech corner. <laughs> but anyways, okay, so next we're going to be talking about our Amateur Radio Club Spotlight. All right, so in this episode, we're going to be talking about the Chesapeake Amateur Radio Service in our Amateur Radio Club Spotlight. You can find them on the internet at w4car.org. That's whiskey for Charlie Alpha Romeo.org. They also have a Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash w4car. They're on Twitter, w4car. Instagram, again, w4car. They also have a YouTube channel. I'm not going to say that. You'll have to go to the show notes to get to it. Or you can probably search on YouTube for Chesapeake Amateur Radio Service or w 4 for car i'm sure you can also go to the show notes super easy i have all the links on the show notes of today's episode okay so as far as their meetings they have 
their general club meeting on the first Monday of every month at 116 Reservation Road in the Great Bridge section of Chesapeake. And we're talking about Vermont, I think, this this month. <laughs> uh, I hate it when I don't write stuff down that I'm trying to think of. Um, okay, so they're repeaters. They actually have three of them. They have two two-meter repeaters and a 440 repeater. Uh, they have one on 146.610 with a PL of 162.2. They have 146.82 repeater, again, PL of 162.2. And they have a 444.000 repeater with a PL of 162.2, and it is a system fusion repeater. Yezu system fusion repeater. They're working on one of the 2-meter repeaters, getting that on system fusion as well. But for right now, all they have is a 440 on system fusion. Um, they have two nets. Uh, the weekly uh, CARS uh, net is on Sundays at 8 p.m. on the 146.82 repeater. The uh, Chesapeake uh, Aries net, the CARES net, is on Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Also on the 146.82 repeater. So if you are in the Chesapeake area... During a Sunday evening, during Wednesday evening, if you live in the area and you don't know about them, check out the Chesapeake Amateur Radio Club on their nets and their meetings first Monday of the month. Um, pretty active club from what I can tell. They do the Virginia, okay, it's Virginia, not Vermont, sorry everybody. Uh, they do the Virginia CUSA party, they do field day, uh, they do Battle of Great Bridge special event, they participate in their local Aries group. They do a Tour de Cure, a uh, special event. They do communications for that race. And they also have what they call a Shack Day. On the third Saturday of the month, their club shack is open to all members as well as to the general public. And they have operators on hand to get people to check out um, this stuff. And I hope y'all didn't just hear that doo go off. <laughs> if you did, I'm sorry about that. That was my Dropbox saying, hey, you got a new thing on your on your computer. Uh, but anyways, um, it, yeah, that it, that is the Chesapeake Amateur Radio Service. So definitely check them out. Check out their website. A lot of inf- a lot of neat information on there. A lot of great pictures on there as well on their Facebook. Uh, follow them on Twitter and Instagram as well as YouTube. Uh, they have quite a few training videos, I believe, on YouTube if memory serves me correctly. All right, so that wraps up the Amateur Radio Club Spotlight. Let's go on to the upcoming events. Okay, so earlier in this episode, at the very beginning, I mentioned a survey that I'm asking all y'all all to take. And you can find that at everythinghamradio.com forward slash survey. One of the people who took the survey made me wholeheartedly agree. I really got tired of saying the same thing twice in an episode, like the NCC Sprint and the NCC RTTY Sprint. I, ha- I said that twice every episode. So what I'm doing is I'm taking and I'm getting rid of the weekly events and having it work just mainly the once a month events or once a year events. Now I might make it where the first episode of the month, I say something like every Thursday at two 30 to three 30 is the NCC sprint or whatever the time is that uh, that's probably not the correct time. But anyways, I might do that like the first episode of the month, but I'm not going to do it every episode. And I, I, I might not even do it at all. You know, I mean, if you're participating in like the NCC sprint, you're probably going to know that it's going to happen every Thursday. So, but anyways, um, every time that I'm going to say in the events is in Zulu time as well. So on January the 7th from 0 hundred hours to 2400 hours is the PODXS 070 Club PSK Fest. From January the 7th from 1200 to 20 hours is the WWPMC contest. December the 7th from 1200 to January... December. January the 7th from 1200 to January the 8th. At 2400 hours is the SKCC Weekend Sprintathon. January the 7th from 1500 to January the 8th of 1500 is the original QRP contest. Also, January the 7th from 1,800 hours to January the 8th at 2,400 hours is the ARRL RTTY Roundup. 
January the 7th from 1800 hours to 2359 is the Kids Day Contest. We talked a lot about it last episode. If you missed it, go back and check out episode number 49 and where we talked a little bit about the news for Kids Day as well as some uh, uh, as well as some videos that I had in the show notes. So check out that uh, in last episode. Um, next up, January the 7th from 2800 hours to 2300 hours. And the 8th from 400 to 700 hours is the EUCW 160 meter contest. January the 8th from 900 hours to 1059 is the DARC 10 meter contest. On January the 11th for at uh, 12 at 2300 hours to January the 12th at 2300 hours and on the 14th from 2300 to 15th at 2300 is the AWA Link Kundal Memorial CW contest so that goes two weekends in a row January the 13th from 230 to 300 hours is the NCCC sprint ladder January the 14th from 500 hours to 900 hours is the Old New Year Contest. January 14th from 1200 to January 15th at 1200 is the UBA PSK 63 Prefix Contest. January the 18th from, or correction, January the 14th from 1800 hours to January the 15th at 559 is the North American QSO Party on CW. January 15th from 6.30 to 8.30 is the NRAU Baltic Contest on Single Sideband. Followed from 900 hours to 1100 hours on the 15th is the CW portion of that contest. And last but not least, on January the 16th from 200 hours to 400 hours is the Run for the Bacon QRP Contest. All the information about all these events and contests were found on the WA7BNM contest calendar, which you can find a link in the show notes of today's episode. Alright, so for our ham fest, we have a lot of them that are coming up. Last episode, we didn't have any. But now after Christmas, here we go again. So, on the 7th, January the 7th, 2017, that sounds so weird saying... We start out the year with the Freeze Fest in Locust Fork, Alabama, the LARC's annual ham fest in White Pine, Tennessee, and West Alice Rack's 45th annual Midwinter Swap Fest in uh, Wacosa, Wisconsin. On the 8th, the next day, is the New York City Long Island Section Convention, Ham Radio University 2017, in Bethpage, New York. The next weekend, on the 14th, we have the Greenwood Ham Fest in Greenwood, South Carolina, the San Antonio Radio Fiesta in Swartz, Texas, the TARC Fest in Tampa, Florida, Tech Fest 2017 is going to be in Lawrenceville, Georgia, the Thunderbird Ham Fest 2017 is in Phoenix, Arizona. I actually went to that Ham Fest back in 1998, I believe, when I was in college out there in Phoenix. Uh, let's see. Next up is the Winston-Salem First Fest in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Winter Ham Fest 2017 in Loveland, Colorado. And on the 15th, we have the Sunday Creek Amateur Radio Federation Ham Fest in Nelsonville, Ohio. All the information for these ham fests were taken from the AWRL Ham Fest calendar, which you can find on the AWRL website or in a link to them in the show notes of today's episode. All right, so lastly, let's talk about some news for the upcoming, uh, or for this episode. All right, so a little earlier when we were talking about the Winter Ham Fest and the bonus points you can get for satellite contacts, this is what I was talking about. This is what I was referring to. In On the 29th, the AWOL posted this uh, news article. New amateur radio FM transponder CubeSat is now in space. The BY-70-1 CubeSat was launched on December 28th from the Taiwan Space Launch Center in China, but in a lower orbit than intended. The satellite carries an an amateur radio FM transponder. BY-70-1 was intended to go in a 530-kilometer 
approximately 329 mile circular sun synchronous orbit. But it appears the orbit is a 524 by 12, 212 kilometers, which will give the spacecraft an orbital lifetime of just a month or two. So try to get contact on this satellite during winter field day. That would be you know really cool. It's only going to be going to be up for a month or so. So by the end of January, it could possibly be crashing back down to Earth. Uh, Paul Swar- Stolzer, uh, N8MHM, reported working Wyatt Dirks AC0RA through the FM transponder during the 1709 UTC pass on December 28th. Uplink requires precise frequency adjustments, and there's a delay on the downlink, but the signal is strong, he says. BY70-1 is a 2U CubeSat project for education and amateur radio. It features a 3-axis stabilization and deployable solar panels. In addition to the FM transponder, BY70-1 has a camera and plans call for downloading images and telemetry via a 9600 baud BPSK downlink. The IR the IARU amateur satellite frequency coordination page lists the uplink on of 145.92 megahertz and a downlink of 436.2 megahertz. You can check out the AMSAT, uh, amsat-uk uh, website for more information. All right, so next up, the FCC denies expert linear's request for waiver of 15 dB rule. Petition is pending. On December the 27th, the AWRL released this news brief. The FCC has denied a request by expert linear America LLC to waive the 97.317 section A subsection 2 of the amateur service rules limiting an amplifier gain. Expert of Magnolia, Texas, distributes linear manufactured by SPE in Italy. Its waiver request, filed in June, would have allowed Expert to import an amplifier capable of exceeding the current 15 dB gain limitation as it awaits FCC's action on its April petition RM-11767 to revise the same amateur service rules. That petition remains pending. Expert has asserted that there should be no gain limitation on amplifiers sold or used in the amateur service. Most comment- commenters supported Expert's waiver request, but a couple of commenters, including Flex Radio, demurred. In light of the conflicting comments regarding the desirability of eliminating the 15 dB limitation, we concluded that waiving the limitation at this stage of the rulemaking process would prejudice the rulemaking proceeding and prematurely dispose of commenters' concern, the FCC said in denying the waiver. Moreover, we agree with Flex Radio that granting experts waiver request while the rulemaking petition remains pending would prove an unfair market advantage for one equipment model over an other manufacturer's RF power amplifier that would still be limited by the existing rules. The FCC said that it would rather give full consideration to the pending issues and apply the results of the rulemaking proceedings to all amateur radio service equipment. The commission said rules waivers waivers generally are not warranted merely to accommodate technical parameters that are based solely on a harmonization with the manufacturer's product already available abroad. The SCC said a, minor, a minority of those commenting on the waiver request expressed concerns that eliminating the 15 dB limitation would lead to an overall increase in power levels, including transmissions that intentionally or unintentionally exceed the maximum power limit. In its April rulemaking petition, expert maintained that 15 dB gain limitation is an unneeded holdover from the days when amplifiers were less efficient, and the FCC was attempting to rein in the use of amateur service amplifiers by citizen band operators. Although the FCC has proposed in 2014 to delete the requirement that amplifiers be designed to use a minimum of 50 watts of drive power and subsequently did, it did not further discuss the 15 dB limitation in the subsequent report and order of that proceeding. Expert has pointed to its model 1.3K FA amplifier as an example of a linear 
inherently capable of consist considerably more than 15 dB of ampl amplification, which would make it suitable match for low power transceivers now on the market. What are y'all's thoughts on this? <laughs> Nowadays, it seems that radios are more efficient, that amplifiers are more efficient, they're more, uh, they don't have the wavering and stuff like the old two types uh, would have. I'm kind of on the fence on this. Um, you know, yes, it would be nice, and you know, especially since there's not that minimum 50 watts of drive power. This would really be nice with like one of the Elecraft radios that have you know the 10 watt drive power or a 5 watt drive power. If you can have an amplifier that could amplify at 20 dB, you know, and have a decent range, a def decent power output. You know, I I don't know. I'm just on the fence in this one, but. What what are y'all's thoughts? Let me know in the comments of today's show notes what y'all think about this um, and their request to get rid of the 15 dB gain limitation. Leave it in the show notes. Again, everythinghamradio.com forward slash podcast forward slash 50 or leave it in the um, Facebook post and it'll automatically put into the uh, the comments of on the website. Okay, so one more thing that I want to talk about. How many of y'all have participated in the National Parks on the Air? Unfortunately, I haven't. I haven't got my HF radio up. It really stinks. But this came out on the 21st of December, and it has gone farther since then. I don't think they had the official totals in yet, but according to the, 20, the article on the 21st, National Parks on the Air contact tally tops 1 million. That's a lot of people, a lot of contacts. So, this article said, Participants in the ARRL's National Parks on the Air program have completed more than 1 million contacts. Activators operating from National Park Services Unit across the U.S. and chasers from around the world pressed the contact tally over its goal this week. The ARRL-sponsored NPOTA to help the National Park Service celebrate its centennial. National Parks on the Air has become one of the most popular events in history of the league in POTA, Administrator Sean Kutzko, KX9X, said. It has been fun seeing so many hams take part. That it that, That's true. That That's amazing, the participation this thing has had. Uh, Kutzko said the NPOTA Facebook group really helped drive participation, especially in the last three months, when it became clear that the 1 million QSA goal was within reach. Some 25,000 NPOTA contacts were uploaded to Logbook of the World every week since October, he noted. The entire group came together and simply willed the 1 million contact mark to be broken. It was incredible to watch. He said some real friendships developed among those who frequented the NPOTA Facebook page. Those taking part in the POTA made nearly 20,000 visits to 460 of the 489 National Park Service units eligible for the National Parks on the Air credit, including portions of the National Trail System and the National Wild and Scenic River System. Nearly 150 chasers completed contact with more than 400 of the 489 MPOTA units this year, while one activator transmitted from more than 250 different park units in 216. Kutzko said the activation effectively transported those National Park Service units via radio to all 50 states and more than 100 countries during 2016. Kutzko said the NPOTA game garnered interest from hams at all profici proficiency levels, but he was especially gratified to see how it encouraged less experienced hams to acquire new skills, such as operating a portable station on battery power, learning CW, and discovering digital modes. Pileups from some activation rivaled those during a major de-expedition, and only, or if only, for a few hours at a time. Jim Clark Jr., a NPS ranger at Marsh Billings Rockefeller National Historic Park in Vermont, said MPOTA helped to generate greater awareness of his unit. 
National Parks in the Air has afforded us the opportunity to connect with a much larger and more diverse audience than we could have ever imagined, he told the ARRL. We are pleased and proud that the world of amateur radio helped us to celebrate 100 years of service to the nation. Katsuko said being able to blend amateur radio with the history of scenery offered by the National Park Service was a wonderful gift. Quote, he heard from countless amateurs who learned something about their country while operating from the National Park Unit and experiencing the other side of the pileup. While there will be other on-the-air events but from the ARRL, but the National Parks on the Air was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I don't think there will ever be anything quite like it in amateur radio again. I will miss it, he says. Until months in, the NPOTA activators will make a big push to get on the air from National Park Services units all across the country in a final sprint to the finish line. Get in the action as NPOTA ends with a roar on December 31st at 23.59 UTC. As you can tell, it's like the, what, the 7th, I guess, whenever this goes live? Uh, no, the 5th. It's already over with. So if, if I'm sorry, but if you, know, if you didn't get on it, you didn't get on it. As of the, this recording, there was 1,062,159 QSOs, over 20,184 separate activations. It really surprised me when I went through the list of, of the activation states that there was actually 16 parks that were not activated. You know, in that year span, you would think that every one of them would be, but there's actually 16 parks that were not activated. Another thing that really interested me was on the leaderboard page. The person that had the highest number of activation was Stuart Thomas, KB1HQS. He has 500 activation points, again, as, as of this recording. The second place person was N4CD with 335. So you know, that's a pretty big margin between first and second place. So kudos to Stuart. Stuart was a guest over on the Ham Radio 360 podcast a couple months ago, and you can actually go to the show notes, and there's a link to that episode. It was a pretty awesome episode. He is on the cover of the 11th edition of the ARRL Operator's Manual for Radio Amateurs and did a write-up about tips, tricks, and techniques for portable operation in the book. It starts on page 1.76. He also has the article in the November 2016 QSP on page 69, and he was featured in the 2017 ARRL calendar for the month of August. So, I really wish I could have got something, made some contact on there that would have been awesome. And, and kudos to all the people that did this. I imagine it was so much fun uh, going somewhere and checking out. I really wanted to do it. Um, I actually got with the, uh, a former, um, I don't think he was a guest, but one of the people that that either donated or was a guest or something like that that's here locally we talked briefly about going down to uh, Waco, which is just down about 100 miles south of me, and activating one of the parks down there, but we never got to it. And with four and five kids, it, it doesn't surprise me that I didn't. But, you know, I really wish I could at least chase some of these national parks and got some of them. But, you know, when I was looking at the list of activations for the last day of the year, there was probably, I don't know, 40 of them, something like that, that was going on on, on the 31st. So I'm really interested to see what the total, what the final numbers are. And I'm sure it'll probably be, you know, several weeks until all the, the, the logs get uploaded and the final count is tallied. Um, but I'm, I'm really interested to see what the total QSO count was what the, the final point numbers and stuff like that were. But, uh, yeah, so kudos, especially to Stuart Thomas, KB one HQS, for his 500 possibly plus activation points, and and especially and also to uh, enforce CD for 335, and all the others that participated, that activated parks, that chased parks. You know, kudos to each one of y'all. I'm sure y'all had a blast doing it. Um, and again, I, I really wish I would. All right, so that pretty much wraps it up. Um, thank y'all all again for your continued support, your continued listen. Thank you for sharing this episode with your with your friends and my podcast with your friends and family, helping me to grow. Um, I've seen steady growth, especially over the past six months, and I hope to continue to see growth. 
Um, thank you to West Mountain Radio for coming on as a sponsor. Please make sure you check out their their link uh, and their website. Check out all the products that they have. Go and buy you a DC to go box or a rig runner or a rig blaster or anything else that they have on their website. Don't forget to include the discount or the uh, special code EHP. One seven at checkout to get your free gift, your USB port monitor. Also, I want to thank George uh, for his one hundred dollar gift or one hundred dollar gift certificate uh, for me to give away. Uh, I want to thank Dan KB six NU for his uh, ebooks that he's given away, and also possibly one of the other uh, another special gift that I am still waiting on. All the winners will be announced in next week's episode, so make sure you stay tuned for that. Um, to sign up to get those gifts, all you got to do is subscribe to my email list. You can do that on the show notes of today's episode. There's actually two spots you can do it. One at the top, one at the bottom. Uh, you can go to everythinghamradio.com forward slash subscribe and do that. Do it that way. All you got to do is sign up. If you already receive emails from me, if you're already on my uh, uh, email list, you're already entered to win. Uh, and thank you all for your continued support and your continued listen. So you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash everything ham radio. I also have a group at uh, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash everything ham radio. You can find me on Twitter at K5CLM, on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash everything ham radio. I'm on Instagram. I'm, um, I think I'm on Pinterest. Um, there's Tumblr and some other things you can find under social on the main menu on my page. Uh, also, I changed uh, up my website a little bit, so head on over and check that out if you haven't done that already. Um, if you would like to support my podcast financially, I would greatly appreciate it. There are several ways you can do it. You can make a one-time donation through PayPal. Uh, you can also become a, a per-episode contributor. Uh, through Patreon, you can make a one dollar donation per episode, or uh, five dollar, or whatever. There's several levels that are on there. Um, you can also simply shop through Amazon, um, and I will get a small advertising fee for anything that you buy. I also have a couple other affiliate uh, pr- uh, places that I'm going to be putting up on the website. MCM Electronics is one of them. I um, mean, there's another one I don't remember off the top of my head. I just got a confirmation that I got a, the affiliate program activation for that. So those will be up on there, and I'll be talking more about products from those in a later episode. But thank you very much for West Mountain Radio for your sponsorship of this podcast. If you like what you heard here, please share it with your friends. Please uh, give me a review and a star rating on iTunes, Radio, Google Play, wherever you listen to it at. Um, But most importantly, please share it with your friends. Tell them about this podcast. Let them know what you heard here. And uh, again, um, one last thing before we wrap it up. Don't forget about the survey, uh, everythinghamradio.com forward slash survey. Fill out those questions. I would greatly appreciate it. I would love to hear back from y'all on, on how this uh, podcast is going. Um, check in next, hopefully next episode. I'll have a picture of my uh, quote unquote recording studio. And uh, yeah, so I guess that's about it. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I guess until next time. This is K5CLM. Signing out. 73, y'all.